Right. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this our global dot Vivian community meetup. And this is one. This is series of meetup, and this point is fourth one. And we are aware of issues having in Nigeria, so we are sorry for that. But we will be having of this meetup and it will whether you are free. Uh, my name is Abdul, and I handle community relations with our uh, Before we begin, uh, let me just uh, give you uh, like a brief uh, agenda of the meetup. So, first up will be from Thomas, followed by Michael. And at the end of this, uh, after this two talks, there will be like open session. So, if anyone wants to, to present, on uh, anything related to the or anything related to technology with the they can get it with me and then I can find some time for you to specifically for the meetup. And without further ado, let me just tell you uh, about this, uh, our update conference. So, update conference was happening in Prague, Czech Republic, uh, since 2018 19. And because happening this year as well and because of the pandemic so we are now forced to go but so we will be having this uh, conference next month if anyone wants to go on they can get it for this and next is our speaker thomas and we are very excited to have thomas thomas as we know, like he was, he's the founder and CEO of Riganti. Uh, Riganti is a company based out of Czech Republic and it's focused on custom software development, consulting, and software solution architecture services. And Thomas is a creator of Dot VVM and open source framework for simplified creating a line of business application and makes it easier for any document developer. Thomas was awarded MVP, Microsoft. Most valuable professional and and, and and Thomas is also Microsoft Vision Director for the Simplex Community. And Thomas has been speaking worldwide and he is a public speaker and and, and, he, and he has been also speaking in Texas public as well. And also published uh, technical articles uh, uh, across the both across across the various uh, public background. So Without further ado, over to Thomas. So please start it. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks fine. Okay. So thank you, Abdul, for, for the introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, virtual meetup. Uh, I hope that our friends in Nigeria are safe. They have some uh, government protests and they weren't able to uh, connect, unfortunately. So we are recording this for them and hope we, I really hope that they are safe and that their, their, the situation in that country will uh, get better soon. Uh, so let's uh, let's start. I have prepared a session about uh, what's new in .vvm and uh, what we are planning, what we are working on, and I would like to show you a few uh, recently added features to, to .vvm. So uh, anytime you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question. It's not a problem. We don't have a large group of people here, so I don't think it would be. Just, just unmute and ask if you are curious about anything. OK, so. Uh, what happened to my slide? Okay, okay. So, uh, .vvm, uh, I guess that uh, you have uh, heard about it since you are at the, on this meetup, but uh, .vvm is a framework that uh, will allow you to do basically two things. First is uh, building new web applications with a model view, view model approach. So if you want to, uh, if you have experience with MVVM, for example, from uh, WPF or Xamarin, or any other technology, then uh, .vvm will be, I think, the most preferred approach for you because um, you probably know MVVM from these technologies. And of course, if you have an application 
that uh, you think that MVVM would suit it and would help, would be beneficial, then .vvm can be a great choice for building web apps. And of course, it's open source, so you don't have to pay for, for anything. Uh, also, .vvm can do a second uh, thing, and that's modernizing old ASP.NET applications, because uh, there is uh, tons of applications written in ASP.NET web forms, and uh, since web forms are not supported in the latest versions of .NET Core, uh, it means that uh, you either have to continue using the old .NET framework, which is still supported, but it's not getting new features. It's sometimes slow and there won't be many improvements uh, except for some security fixes. And so, so if you want to take benefits of everything new that came to .NET Core, you basically need to rewrite this application. Either you can start a new project alongside the, the old one, or you can incrementally modernize the old code base and eventually switch to .NET Core, which is exactly what .vvm can help with. So I will, I will be, I will be uh, talking about this uh, also very soon. Okay. So if you want to build a new application, you have plenty of choices today. Uh, what you can select, you can use Angular, you can use Knockout, you can use Razor Pages, uh, and uh, we are all the interested in .NET, so there is plenty of ways how to build application on .NET. And uh, with .vvm, it's uh, quite easy to learn because you just need to know C Sharp and HTML. If you know JavaScript, this will very help you in building these apps, but it's not necessary. You can start with just basic knowledge of C Sharp and HTML. You don't need anything, anything else. Uh, what you will find in .vvm is the model view, view model approach I have been talking about or I've mentioned before. Uh, this is uh, a very nice pattern for uh, large applications because it helps you to separate user interface from the business logic. If you uh, don't separate these things well, uh, it means that after a few years when front-end technologies change, they change pretty often, especially on the web, every three years, the web apps are written differently than three years ago. Uh, so the more separated your user interface is from the actual business logic, the better because you can just rewrite the front end and keep the business logic as is. Yeah. So if you, and I have seen a lot of applications where you basically was working, uh, the people were working uh, with the database in the controllers or in the view model. And it's not a good idea because after a few years, uh, you will be stuck at the same technology and you cannot exchange the technology for something else. So from the long-term perspective, it's a great pattern because it helps you to separate UI from, from the business. And also, uh, if you choose, for example, Angular or Knockout, uh, sorry, or React or Vue or any other popular frameworks, uh, you have to know that these are the client-side things, so they run in the browser. And it means that if you have some data on the server in your database or any in your place, you need to have a way to deliver those data from the server to the browser. So you need to build some kind of API. It can be REST API, it can be GraphQL, it can be practically anything, but you need to uh, create the API, which on, on one hand, it helps you a lot with the separation of the business logic from the user interface because the API is a clear line of separation. However, it's a lot of effort to build a reliable, secure API, and uh, also you need to maintain it. If you rename something on the server, you have to rename it on the client. Maybe you will need some API versioning and things like that. So this is a lot of work. I'm not saying it's not possible. It's definitely possible. A lot of projects have such APIs, but it's an additional effort you need to do. With .vvm, you don't need to build API because .vvm will get the data from the server to the client and back for you automatically. You, 
wouldn't even know about uh, about this. You don't have to do anything specific for this to happen. And uh, what uh, also I quite like on dot VVM is that uh, it's a little bit lighter than Blazor. Blazor can do a similar things. You also can uh, build web apps with C sharp and HTML. You don't need to know JavaScript. On the other hand, Blazor has two versions. First is the WebAssembly version, which basically means that you need to download the entire .NET runtime, or at least the parts of the .NET runtime that are necessary for the application. So anything that the application will use from .NET needs to be downloaded to the client. And also, if you look at the basic Hello World application, they are shipping with Blazor, and you see how much data it needs to download it still downloads something like two megabytes of data. And if you write a real application with hundreds of pages, this won't probably be two megabytes. It will probably be maybe 10 megabytes or 15 megabytes. And that can be a lot for uh, some use cases. If it's uh, some internal company application that's used only in your company, in your office, it shouldn't be a problem because you have a wired connection and you use the application often, so it will probably be cached. But uh, if it's a mobile app, for example, which you need to use anywhere, and not everywhere is a great, uh, .net, uh, great um, coverage, so that can be a problem. So this is useful for some kind of applications, but uh, also there is a lot of use cases where you cannot uh, use WebAssembly. And also there is a second version of Blazor, which uh, runs on the server and keeps a signal R connection to the client. So it doesn't need to download so much data, but still it needs a stable and persistent connection between the, the client and server. And the latency should be very low because otherwise you will click and wait until something happens. So it needs a stable connection, which is also not the case on um, on all places and in all use cases. So uh, I'm not saying Blazor is bad. It's not. It's a great piece of technology, and I'm amazed that they even managed to uh, get .NET runtime running in the browser. But on the other hand, there is a price you need to pay uh, for the Blazor, not in money, but in the network resources or server resources or the network connectivity. So. And .vvm doesn't have that because .vvm is uh, on the server, it's a NuGet package, but it's not downloaded to the client uh, machine. And it's just a JavaScript library, which is less than 100 kilobytes, including knockout.js, which is used by .vvm. So this is less than 100 kilobytes, so it's significantly smaller. And also as a benefit, uh, we still support all .NET framework and because .vvm is used by a lot of uh, government institutions who have old machines with old browsers, so .vvm still supports Internet Explorer 11. Yeah, so we don't like it. We would like to get rid of support of this, um, this browser, but it would make a lot of our customers uh, really angry. And also the Czech tax office is using, uh, is using uh, .vvm and they need IE 11, so that's the reason why my company really cannot uh, stop supporting IE 11. Okay, uh, so uh, what's the current status of .vvm? Uh, current uh, version, which is in production, is 2.4, and it brought uh, several new features, both uh, basically concern optimization and uh, efficiency of, of the applications. The first, and I will have a demo for that, is the server-side view model cache. It uh, lowers the data transfers between the client and server. So even before .vvm was exchanging some data between the browser and the server, and uh, now if, uh, if you turn this feature on, uh, you will need to transfer less data. Yeah, so, and we are still talking about kilobytes. You will see in the demo that instead of 15 kilobytes, we will transfer like two or something like that. So we are not talking about, about megabytes of data like in Blazor, but only kilobytes. But still, even these values can be uh, reduced. So we decided to do it. Uh, there's also uh, other features, and we have a release notes on GitHub. The second quite interesting feature is uh, 
lazy CSR F token loading. Uh, basically, all dot VVM applications and all dot VVM requests are secured using a CSRF token. It uh, prevents an attacker to uh, create a special special script or link that will post or make a request to your site under the credentials of your user. So it's a security mechanism. But unfortunately, until 2.4 dot VVM was including this token, which is different for every user into the HTML that was produced by the runtime. So uh, you cannot, you couldn't cache this page because uh, it would contain the token and it shouldn't uh, contain this token. So if we turn this feature on, you will be able to cache the HTML produced by uh, .vvm and for example, embed it in a progressive web app. So if you want to make uh, your website a mobile application, you can just add uh, the PVA manifest and uh, you can turn this feature on and you will be able to include all the pages together with the application. So this can help if you want to build mobile websites or progressive web apps with uh, .vvm. And we will be releasing .vvm 2.5 uh, very soon. We already published several public previews and the, late, the next release will really be the production ready uh, version. And we have also done some optimizations, so we have faster startup and uh, easier modernization of all applications because uh, there is an option to disable assembly discovery and loading because .vvm, for some historical reasons, it tries to discover all the libraries your application is using and it does it on the startup. So uh, it slows the startup down because some of the libraries wouldn't have to be loaded on the application startup. They could load only if they are actually used. But the VVM, from the historical reasons, it just loaded everything at the beginning. And now with this feature, it does doesn't have to. So that uh, could uh, that could also uh, help with faster startup of of the applications. And now the team is uh, working on the VVM 3.0, which we hope we don't have a release date for it, but uh, it will bring a lot of new features. We all already have quite a lot of them implemented. I think that we are in 50% or something like that. And uh, it will also focus on some optimizations, efficiency, and also it will have more features on the client side. So you will be able to do more things on the on the on the client side using uh, JS modules feature, which I will show uh, later. And also, we have put a lot of focus into modernization scenarios of .vvm, uh, so you can uh, use .vvm to modernize uh, legacy web forms applications, and you can do it on the fly. You don't need to just rewrite application to .vvm because in such case you can choose if you rewrite the application using Angular or React or Blazor. Yeah, so the point is not to take old application, start over and just write everything in .vvm. That wouldn't help you much and you can choose a different technology. Of course, you can choose .vvm, but uh, it depends. So for some applications, maybe uh, React would be a better choice. Yeah. But uh, if you cannot start a new project over and start rewriting everything, then .vvm can really help because it's basically the only technology that you can install in a current application and just uh, allow to incrementally replace uh, page by page. And while you are doing this, the application still works. Yeah, because you can combine these two technologies in the same application. Yeah, so you can start replacing one by one and after you get rid of all web forms pages, you will just be using only uh, .vvm. So then you might switch the project to .NET Core because .vvm is the same. It has the same syntax, same view models, same libraries. Everything is the same. So that's what you can do. So let's look at the first feature. I, ha I will have a demo for it. And it's server-side view model cache. So it reduces the data transferred between client and server. Basically, .vvm will remember the view model on the server, so it will store it in some cache. Uh, and uh, right now it's in memory, but it's extensible. So if you want to use, for example, Redis or other cache solution, maybe for distributed apps, if you want to 
host your app on multiple instances, you will need it. Uh, but basically the view model is stays on the server and uh, when uh, you click on a button in the page, that VVM won't need to just take the entire view model and send it back to the server because right now the, the server should have the view model in the cache. Previously, it wasn't the case. We didn't want to cache. It was that VVM was always a stateless technology. So once you create the response for the request and send the view model to, to the client, dot VVM just get rid of it. It didn't store it anywhere. That's why the client, if you need to continue working with the page, the client had to send the view model back to the server. And it has to be a complete view model because server didn't know about the previous request at all. It didn't store any information for it. But right now, if the server side view model cache, the view model is cached on the server. So the client doesn't need to send the entire view model, but it can send only the changes. So if you change something in a text box, for example, or if you do something on the page, your view model is changing and that VVM will only transfer the changes, not the entire view model. And luckily there is a lot of situations where the client doesn't change the view model at all. If you, for example, look at the page with some grid view, so you have 20 rows of some data, and you want to delete the first, uh, first row, you don't need to change the view model. You just tell the server, okay, please delete the first row, but I haven't changed anything in the table, anything in the view model. So basically what client sends is just empty diff because nothing has changed. And server remembers the view model from the last request, so it should be able to have all the information it really needs. And uh, now there is just one problem. What happens if the cache is lost? For example, if your application restarts and the cache is just in memory, so you will lose it. And in .vvm it's not a problem because if .vvm sends the view model diff to the server and server say, okay, sorry, I don't have the, the item in the cache anymore, then .vvm will immediately create a second request that will send the entire view model. So it will be a little slower because you are making two requests, but it will work. So it's, uh, it's a good uh, compromise between uh, speed and reliability because if we only wanted the fast solution, the cache would have to be stored some in some persistent storage, for example, in the database, and that will be slower. Yeah, so we have the speed on one hand, reliability on the other hand, and we are somewhere in between. So it's very nice. And also, if thousands of users come to your website, they will probably have the same view models on many pages because uh, if the pages offers only static data, all the users will have the same view model. So there is no point in remembering then that view model thousand times. And that's why we are using the hash of the view model as an ID. So if there's a million users, but their view model is still the same, we will store it only once on the server. And once it's changed, it will get a different hash, so it will get a different ID. Yeah, but we just don't have duplicated copies of the same view models on the server. So this is this is how it works. So let's see the demo. I have uh, took our uh, Northwind Traders sample project, and if you want to uh, find it, you can just say .vvm.com and go to samples, and there is the there is the link for it. So there is the link to the Northwind sample on GitHub, so you can you can uh, download it and try it. And there is a new branch called Server Side View Models, and that's that's uh, what you need to uh, check out uh, if you want to play with this demo. I will be I will be showing. So this is uh, basically it's a very simple application. I have a listing of products in the i will make it a little bit larger so it's it can be it's it's uh, more visible and uh, so let's uh, let's see it's the, just a table and there is a paging and uh, i have uh, this diagnostic uh, console it's a little piece of javascript i have added in the application 
So whenever I make postback, this console will tell me how many bytes was uploaded to the server and how many bytes was downloaded. So this is the size of the request and this is the size of the response. And you can see that it's not, it's not very nice because for just switching the pages in, in a grid view, I, have, I had to upload 14 kilobytes of data to the server and download about 20 kilobytes. In reality, it's not that much because uh, there's a thing which is called the HTTP compression. So all the communication between server and client is compressed and which makes the sizes something like 30% of that. So basically about five kilobytes was uploaded, were uploaded to the server and about seven or eight, eight kilobytes were downloaded. Yeah, so it's about 30% of that because of the compression, but still it's unnecessary bloat because the server won't even use the data in this table. It, it will just throw them away because they will load the new page. Yeah, so when you switch the pages, you can see that uh, uh, you are downloading more data. Uh, the, the first page has more results, so when I'm going back to the first page, there's more data than, uh, than uh, on the second page. So that's why this is bigger and this is uh, less because I have been uploading less data. So that's uh, how it looks like in normal situations. Still, it's, it's pretty fast because this is not so much, but uh, it's of course more than it has to be. So let's look uh, in the code. And from .vvm 2.4, you can do this. You can say, in, uh, and I'm in the .vvm startup file when you, where you just specify the configuration of .vvm, and uh, you can say config dot experimental features server side view model cache, and you can enable this feature for all, all routes. And there are other options. If you want to try this feature, you can just enable it for one specific route, so you don't need to turn this on everywhere you can turn it on one route and see what it does because you are using now uh, you will be using the in-memory cache of the server so the application will probably need more memory to run so you can be you should be careful in production with this feature because you might increase the the amount of memory the application will uh, actually need yeah but uh, when i enable this so now it's compiled. So let's go back and let's remember these numbers. It was 14 or 15 kilobytes up and 20 kilobytes down when I went to the page two. So let's refresh this page. Now the application is recompiled with the new settings. So now I will have the server side cache enabled. So it was 15 up, 20 down. So let's see how it changed. So when I click two, you can see now it's two up because there is some still some metadata that will have to be sent to the server, but not, not the data in the table itself because server has them. And I'm getting 11 kilobytes down. So this is something like 20% uh, of the original amount. And this is something like 50%. So the decrease of the of the data transfer is quite significant and it can help in mobile scenarios on poor networks and uh, in, in many other cases. Also, if you make a page which is really crazy, like it will have 1000 lines in the grid view and I don't think it's a reasonable way to make pages because nobody will be able to find anything in that table basically, so uh, that these these values will be bigger. So this feature will save quite a lot of data. When I go back to the first page, you can see that this 30, this 30 kilobytes, it's necessary because it's the data of the table. It's, it's the, the information the page actually needs, but the uploaded data to the server is quite small. So this is what actually uh, decreased the most. And there is also one feature. If you turn this on, you can uh, you can also install a NuGet package that uh, is called uh, 
It is called .vvn.diagnostic.serverside cache. And this package will give you a dashboard for uh, this feature. And uh, you need to also, also uh, turn it uh, here, options at server side uh, cache diagnostics. So, and uh, I have a link for it. And this is a dashboard which tells you how much data this feature saved to. So you can see that uh, I have a list of routes here. I have only visited this route. So here on all other routes, there are zeros. But here on this project list, you can see that I have three instances of the view model in the cache. Yeah. So that's uh, basically, that's the first page when I first visited it. Then I switched to the second page and I went back to the first page. And if I, for example, if I refresh this page and refresh it several times, you will see that nothing really changed here if I refresh it. There are still three because I'm reusing the instances in the cache that are already present because the view model is the same for all the refreshes. So it saves the memory. This feature took only 70 kilobytes of the server memory yeah, in addition to the memory that VPN and the application will need. So this is not so significant, but of course you have to, you should test it because uh, anything can happen. And if the site has millions of users, of course, it will probably need more instances and thus more memory. Uh, here, there is also how much data was actually transferred. So we were transferring something like six kilobytes. And without this feature, we would transfer about 70 kilobytes. So we saved something like 90% of, of the data transferred, which is pretty amazing. I, I think that it can uh, really help uh, to improve the application responsiveness. So when you click, you will get the response uh, more uh, faster. So before turning this on, on in the production, uh, use this page and there is a legend, there is a explanation what every column means, how it's calculated. So you can see what, uh, what settings is uh, good for you. And if you find a page where you will have a very high numbers of the cached view model instances. Then you should look in the view model because maybe you have some value that uh, always changes. For, for example, something like uh, daytime new or something like that. Yeah. So uh, if there is something that uh, is still changing on every request, that will prevent the this engine to reuse the same view model. So you should avoid this. And uh, in ideal cases, do not place these ever-changing values in the view models. Otherwise, it will use a lot of memory. And of course, if the server gets low on memory, uh, these cache items will be removed. So uh, it's not a problem. But uh, if if the cache item is removed and you make the you make the request, then the application will have to do two requests, and the users will wait longer. So you want to tune this feature in a way that the people won't get necessary requests. So yeah, so you want to share as much in the cache as possible. And also you want uh, to have enough memory so the cache items wouldn't be removed. So the users won't have, um, won't have to do multiple, multiple requests. Yeah, and uh, that's what you can see in this uh, the second part, if uh, it's in the red, it means that there was a cache miss. So the server, uh, so the client sent a request and the view model was not present in the cache. And I can, I can uh, easily uh, simulate this. Uh, oh no, no, let's, let's not do this. It's, it's, uh, I could, uh, I could uh, replicate this uh, like this. If you look at the VVM, in a, now I'm in a, in a JavaScript console. Through uh, view models root. Yeah. So if you look in the .vvm view models root, you will see the view model, which is here, and you will see view model cache ID. And if I remove the view model cache ID, or if I just change the value to something else that won't be present in the cache, so something like this then 
when I make the post back, and uh, I will be looking in the network uh, in the network tab, so we will see the requests. Now, when I click on something, you can see it made two requests. The first was without without the entire view model, so you can see there are actually two requests. And the first request get this response from the server view model is not cached, and dot VVM immediately takes the entire view model and sends it to the server. So this is how I simulated the cache mesh. So you can see it made two requests, and the second one was always the, also the large one. Yeah. And if I look here in this dashboard, you will see that now I had 3.6 kilobytes sent to the server, but it they weren't used for a good because the item was not in the cache. Yeah. So I had to repeat the post back, and that took this amount of memory. And here is the number of missed postbacks. So that's how this dashboard works. Make sure you try it before locally before uh, using in production because it may have some side effects in some cases. And uh, remember that you can turn this feature only for specific routes, so you don't need to turn it everywhere. So if it doesn't work on one route, it's easy. Just uh, disable it for that particular route, but keep it enabled on all the others. Okay, so that's the server-side view model cache. It's already present in .vvm 2.4, so you can you can just try it. And uh, so I have uh, also a second tiny block of the session, uh, and it's uh, the improvements in uh, our .vvm extension. If you install the extension uh, for uh, .vvm in Visual Studio, you can do it very easily. You can just go to extensions, manage extensions, and search for .vpn. So that should bring you this extension and there will be the install button. I already I already have it installed, so there is no button, but you, if you don't have it, you would see the button. And that installs the .vpn extension and you will get the syntax highlighting and all those features, all those features uh, in this markup. So that's, uh, that's pretty, mm, pretty useful. And we have done uh, some improvements recently in this extension. So there was a lot of performance uh, enhancements because we are using .vvm internally in our company for quite big projects with thousands of lines in .html files. So uh, in some cases, the extension was really slow. So we tried to debug it on the most complicated pages we have uh, created and it uh, it uh, really helped to uh, make this a little bit faster. So if you are struggling with performance problems, make sure to update to the latest version. It should be better and better in, in the performance. And we have also added some new features. For example, if you try to create a grid view and you say data source equals and bind it to something in the view model, then there is the light bulb which will appear and it will allow you to generate columns for based on the type in the view model. So uh, make sure you can you try it. It's pretty amazing. And if you want to make a simple grid page, that's what you can what you can do. Make sure you declare the property in the view model first, because if it's not in the view model, the grid view doesn't know what type you will be you will be displaying. So first declare the property in the view model. It has to be a collection or grid view data, grid view data set. And uh, .vvm will help you in generating the grid view columns. And for people who want to use .vvm uh, for the modernization of web forms applications, we have added the add.vvm feature and it will install .vvm in your web forms project. And uh, how the modernization works, I have uh, this uh, animation for it. Basically, uh, what the users uh, start with is the, the web forms application. And uh, when it gets some HTTP request, there is the ASP.NET Web Forms pipeline, which will uh, route this request through some forms authentication to the particular page and maybe the master page or something like that. And then another request comes, so it gets routed to other page and uh, to the master page and also a response is produced. And that's nice. That's how it worked with uh, Web Forms. And the modernization way using .vvm is that you will install .vvm 
.oven package in the same application, so it's still the Web Forms app. And what it actually does is that uh, it also uh, also should install Microsoft Oven host system web, and it makes this Oven request pipeline, and it's basically around the Web Forms pipeline. So the Oven will get the request first, and if it can handle the request, it will handle it. If it cannot handle the request, it will pass it down to the Web Forms pipeline. So when you get a request, it goes through the Oven pipeline to ASP.NET Web Forms because now you have just plain Oven, no middleware register. So Web Forms should work the same way as before. But if you add .vvm page, you can just take any ASPX page and just replace it with a .html page, the OT HTML. So this is the .vvm syntax. And because .vvm is also presented in this uh, Oven request pipeline, then request for old page will get to the ASP.NET Web Forms pipeline, but request for new page, which is already instead of the old one, then it will go through the Oven request pipeline through .vvm and it will be uh, processed by .vvm. So that's how you can have two types of pages in the same application and it will still work. Yeah. And then you can progress with the modernization and it, it, it can take months or maybe years if the application is crazy big. So we can just take one page after another and replace them with .dot HTML .dot .vpn pages and it will still work. Old pages will be handled by ASP.NET Web Forms pipeline and new pages with the Oven request pipeline. And after you get rid of all pages, then all requests are right, routed through .vvm. And that's it. You can remove all the remaining Web Forms artifacts. And now you can move to .NET Core, which means that you will change runtime to .NET Core. You will change .vvm.oven to .vvm.asp.net Core NuGet package. But all these pages and their view models they will stay unchanged. There will, won't be any changes. And ASP.NET Core will has a different request pipeline. There is also different authentication. So the only thing you will have to change is the authentication from the old ASP.NET Forms authentication to modern ways of ASP.NET Core, like a cookie authentication middleware, or maybe uh, Azure Active Directory, or any other any other way of authenticating. And that's that's it. You have your application running on .NET Core with new NuGet packages, new project pipeline, new uh, build and faster build and compile times, and all the benefits that .NET Core gives to you. And the requests go the same way as before, but through the new pipeline. So let's look at uh, the add.vvm demo because it's really it's really nice. I have downloaded a popular Web Forms application, which is called Block Engine. Maybe some of you is running your block site on this Block Engine. It was a very popular project built on ASP.NET. It's quite old. It started, I don't know why, when, but uh, I think that it's more than 10 years. It's a really old application. And you can see there is the just uh, the ASP.NET pages, like default ASPX and things like that. So this is classical ASP.NET Web Forms. And uh, what you can do if you install the latest version of the extension, you can use this add.vvm feature. And it uh, tells you that you do you really want to do this because you can screw your project up. So make sure you are using Git or other source control so you can go back in time. Uh, but if you agree, you can just click on OK and wait for a couple of seconds because it's now installing uh, NuGet packages. And it will also add several files in, in your project. Let's see them in a, in a few seconds after the package is uh, installed. So that's the first package, .vvm.owin. And there will be second package coming and that's uh, Microsoft Owen host system web, which will do the trick with the Owen pipeline. So let's wait for it. Yeah, so you can see now, now the project references are uh, being added. 
yeah, now it installed Microsoft Open Host System Web. It did a lot of uh, other things. It uh, added the startup file, which is a configuration for the Owen because it wasn't present in the project before. It added .vvm startup, which is our file when, where you can configure uh, .vvm. So we are registering routes using auto discover routing strategy. So any page will be automatically discovered and uh, included in the project. And there is also the views and view models folder. So you can just click and say add and uh, new item and you can look for .vvm stuff. So I can create a page that's called test, for example, and it allows me to create a view model also. And uh, what is really nice is that how nicely these two technologies are integrated. Now, when I will run this page, it will, it wouldn't display anything because I can say hello from .vvm and I can run the project and we will see that this page will actually work. So I will be running two frameworks in the same application. But uh, the nice thing is how it's integrated because for example, the block engine is using authentication. So there is some admin section, you can log in and you can do stuff. And uh, what's nice is that you can use the same authentication in .vpm. So if you log in in the for web forms part, you will still have the user identity in the .vvm part. Yeah, so it's sharing the user identity. There is basically a single sign-on between the, these two frameworks. So now the block engine is starting. I don't know why it takes so long, but it looks like teams always eat a lot of uh, CPU power. So everything is slower than, than usual when I'm sharing the screen. But I think that in a few seconds, uh, home page of the block engine should uh, should uh, start okay i hope that I am not sure what it's doing, but okay, now, now we are here. So welcome to blockengine.net. So this is a page which is written in SPNet web form. So this is the old technology. And if you go to slash test, it's in the new technology. Now there's also, it starts a couple of seconds because uh, .vvm also is starting. There are two frameworks, so you have to start up but it's only for the first request. If I refresh it, now it's immediate. Now it's it's here. So now I'm you running two different technologies in the same project. Actually, I'm running three technologies in the project because the admin section is not done in web forms. It's done in MVC by the authors of uh, Block Engine. But it only demonstrates how SP.NET is actually flexible that it can run several frameworks in the same application. And if I uh, would like to demonstrate the uh, single sign-on. So I can use the authenticated view control and this control in .vvm basically can display different content to people who are logged in and to anonymous users. So if you are authenticated, so let's say, hello, registered user. And if you are not authenticated, then say we can say, hello, anonymous. So that's it. Okay. So, uh, let's uh, let's go back. And I'm not signed in, so I'm seeing hello anonymous. But if I go to the admin section, and there's another startup because uh, that's the MVC starting. It's nice that first request to a page in the. A specific technology takes a little bit longer, but then it should be okay. So let's log in as the administrator. And now I'm signed in, in MVC and in web forms and also in .vvm because if I go here, now you see hello registered user. So you have the same user, so you can integrate .vvm with any uh, part of the website. 
So if you want, for example, to create a, some special part of the admin section in .vvm, you can just use the same CSS style, so it would look the same way, and you can just add some page here, and uh, if, if it's using the same CSS, nobody will actually know that it's running in a different, in a different technology. So that's how you can extend uh, web forms applications with .vvm. And if you want to modernize this application, then now you can take page by page, so archive, contact, default, error, and so on, and you can replace these pages with .vvm equivalents. And we have uh, another tool which can help you with this. And uh, uh, where is my browser? I want my browser. Okay, here. Um, and if you go to .vvm.com slash webforms, there is a tool which is called SPX to .vvm converter. And you, it can help you with the migration because you can just take some, sorry, uh, you can take some ASPX markup and paste it here. Oh, sorry. The clipboard didn't really work. Okay, let's try again. Okay, this is the markup. And we can click continue and it allows you to apply some changes. So, for example, there is no SP content control in .vvm. It's called DOT content. So, it can just help you to do the change. So, now it's changed to DOT content. And also, there is, for example, a run it server. So, all the run it servers which are here, I don't want them because we don't use this in uh, .vvm. So, you can apply these fixes. Yeah. And also, there are some other things you will have to do. This tool doesn't do 100% of the things that you could write differently in uh, SPNet Web Forms, but still it will help you at least with some transformations. So, this can be, this can be really useful. Now you can take this and paste it to your page in uh, Visual Studio, and it should also underscore other things that are problematic. So you will see this squiggles because we are not .vvm doesn't know ASP placeholder. There is a different component for that, and also the data binding syntax it's also different. So you will need to change it, but still it will help you at least with some changes which is pretty nice and it can help the migration. Okay, so that's how the modernization works and a few, uh, two or three last slides. What are the plans for .vvm 3.0? The team is right now working on .vvm 3.0. We don't know when it's uh, gonna be released, but there is still a lot of work uh, on this version. And the uh, most, uh, most, uh, Significant feature we plan to add is called JS modules. Probably the name will change because JS modules is not a very good name for this feature because it means something else. It means JavaScript language modules, which is a feature of JavaScript language. But this feature will allow you to uh, simply call J JS functions from your .vvm controls. So, for example, when you change something in a combo box, you will be able to call a JavaScript function. And also the other way, if you have some JavaScript code and you want to interact with .vvm, you will be able to, for example, call a command on the server from your JavaScript code. And uh, why we are doing this? Uh, because there is a lot of components that need to interact with JavaScript. Yeah, if you need to call any browser API, if you need to use, I don't know, Google Maps or any other ready-made JavaScript piece of code, then it's currently it's quite difficult to use it from .vvm. Uh, it's possible, but the syntax is not very nice. So what we are doing, we try to simplify this and allow this syntax to be much cleaner. And uh, .vvm was started in 2014, so it's quite old. And at that time, we thought that we really wouldn't need uh, any JavaScript at all. But since then, JavaScript made a great progress and the language got a lot of new features. So I think that we also changed our opinion not to avoid JavaScript, but just to simplify 
writing web apps. And if there is something you will need from JavaScript, so we want it to be as easy as possible. So you wouldn't need to know JavaScript really well. You would just be able to include some JavaScript library and simply call it from .vvm. So that's what we are trying to do. There will be also some improvements in the data binding. Now you can use some functions, you can use expressions and bindings, but this the set of things you can do in the data binding is pretty limited. So we will be extending this feature set. For example, we plan to support link functions. So if you, for example, load a collection of data from the server and we would like to sort it on the client side, you will be able to do it. Right now, you have to post the collection to the server, have it sorted, and then download it back, which is inefficient. And uh, the JS modules uh, would work uh, something like that. It's just, it's not a final syntax. There may be some changes, some things may be named differently, but in principle, in the page, you will in import your JS module. So this is basically a path uh, to the script but you will import it and you will get a variable called underscore JS and you will be able to call functions in the module. So this will point to your JavaScript file and you will be able to call functions. So you will be able to call, for example, add marker and pass it some parameters. So latitude, longitude and things. And these are uh, values from your view model. So you will be able to take anything you have in the view model and send it to the JavaScript function. And the JS module, the file, it's just a JavaScript file, which will look something like this. So there can be a function which is called init, and it will get called when the page is loaded. So when the page is getting loaded, uh, we will create a new Google map and paste it to the page somewhere. And uh, if you click the button, we will call this add marker function. So it will be here in the commands. You will have to export all the commands you permit to be called from the .vvm like this. And here in the function, you can write a piece of JavaScript that will interact with the map. And also there will be other way through this context variable to call .vvm and change something in the view model. So there will be also the other way from JavaScript to .vvm. So it will be very easy to write a code that interacts with some JavaScript library in the page. And you don't need to give up uh, from .vvm, yeah, because right now it will allow you to do much more. And it doesn't need any significant JavaScript skills. We will generate this uh, pattern for you, so you will just copy paste or create some code inside these functions, but you don't need to really uh, understand how the exports and modules in JavaScript uh, work. Yeah, so this is what, at least part of it will be generated by Visual Studio extension. So we just enter the method bodies in here. And uh, the other features we plan to add, uh, there is a one improvement that was done in Knockout.js, which is used internally in .vvm. So uh, it will improve the client side performance. It's a feature which is called deferred updates. And uh, it was added in Knockout 3.4. We already use Knockout 3.4, but uh, uh, we want to use this. Fe this feature is right now it's not used. It will be used from .vvm3. And uh, basically what it does is that if you change something in the view model, until now Knockout applied these changes to the page immediately. So if you, for example, get a response for a post back from the server, it means that we have to change a lot of things in the view model. For example, if you get a new uh, page in the table in the grid view, we basically need to update all the table styles in the page. And uh, because the way how Knockout did it wasn't very, very fast. If I click here, you can see that they are simulating something like 1000 operations on this table, and it took something like 700 milliseconds. And if they turn on the deferred updates, they will wait for some right moment and update the, the page uh, at the same time. So uh, it takes just 12 milliseconds. Yeah. 
And uh, this is a feature of Knockout.js. It's not a feature of .vvm, but since .vvm is using Knockout.js, we will turn this on from version 3, so you will get this fantastic performance improvement basically for free. And we, we too, because we just turned this feature on by using this, this line in the framework. So it's not uh, a difficult change. And we have already tested this feature on several large projects we had because we were afraid that this feature might break something, but we didn't find any problems with this on quite large projects. So we are not afraid of making this a new default in .vvm. 3.0. There will be also some improvements in um, the grid view dataset. If you are working with the grid views, we have the grid view dataset uh, class, which helps you to do sorting, filtering, paging, and things like that. But it's not pretty extensible. If you are, for example, loading data from some API, uh, then the paging in the grid view dataset doesn't work really well because uh, some APIs uh, want to use something like token based paging. So you pass the ID of the last item you got, and they will get give you next 20 items. But uh, the paging in the grid view data set works like that you need to know the page index and the page size. Yeah, but it doesn't support these tokens. So we will make grid view data set extensible. So you will be able to choose if you are using page index in the paging or if you want to use token based paging. And also, it will be possible to load the grid view data set from a REST API or using static commands. So you don't need to make a full post back and get the new grid view data set. You will be able to just load the data set and don't send the rest of the view model to the server and, and back. So that's what we plan. So I hope this wasn't really long and really fast. Uh, to recapitulate, just uh, .vvm is a framework that can help you with two situations. If you want to build new web application using model view, view model, that's what .vvm can help you with. And if you want to modernize web forms applications and move them someday to .NET Core, you can do it. And you don't need to rewrite the entire application. You can just rewrite the pages. And if the application contains a lot of business logic, you don't need to change it because the VVM works uh, in a similar way. It's, it's, it's running on the server, so you don't need to build API to just uh, to just uh, uh, get the data to the client. The VVM will solve this for you. So that's it from me, and uh, I'm looking forward to the questions. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really good session. Uh, and I got to know about new perspective related to that everything about the VM. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And if you have any uh, trouble basically speaking, then you can post it on WhatsApp group or maybe in the chat here, and then I'll ask on behalf of Uh, all right, fine. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for the session. I hope to see you in the next meetup. And our next speaker is Michael. Let me just share my presentation. Okay, so I need a few more minutes to get the demo running, so we can have the five minute break. Yeah, sure, we can have. Okay, so I, I will get everything set up and then we will start. Uh, my time in one can introduce yourself. You don't know that about it.
Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Nice. So, okay. So, sorry for delay. I had some internet problems, but now it seems to be fine. So, my name is Michal Kichy, and today I want to show you the new view compilation features in .vivian 2.5. The main new feature is the new view compilation modes. In this version, the version 2.4, we only had the lazy compilation. This is fine for the most applications, but, but if you have some large views, then the first user who would access the given page can get the very long load times. So because this these advantages of lazy loading, we added two new, new modes for view compilation. The modes are dream application startup, in, in which the, all views are compiled before the application starts responding to incoming requests. And the next one is after application startup. In this case, the application will start, the request will get, get handled, and after this, the compilation will be done. I will show those features in more detail in the demo. So oh, the new feature is registered in the startup class in the use.view method. In the configuration that markup of view compilation, you can choose which mode will be used. Defaultly, the lazy mode is used. So if we run our demo application, we will get the application which has three pages. We have the good page, which works just fine. It, it's small, so it's quickly quick to compile. We had the bad page, which unfortunately gives us error, but it also loads quick. And then we have the ugly page. Unfortunately, this page will take quite some time to get compiled for the first time. This can happen if your .html markup is really large or when you are accessing the file on some slow disk. In my case, it's just some evil thread sleep in the code. To solve this not so great experience for the first user, we can use the new modes. So we can choose the after application or during application startup mode. And now we will see that the application will take quite some time to start up. But after it starts, all the pages should be accessible instantly. Michael, sorry to interrupt, but uh, are you sharing a code because we see the PowerPoint? Oh, yes. then I will try again. Screen. Okay, this doesn't work as I used. So now you should see the web browser, right? Yeah, great. Yeah. And now you see the code. Nice. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, so backtrack a little bit. It's configured in use the VM in the startup class, and it can be you can choose the mode in some in the configuration markup view compilation and mode. In the demo application, I have three only three pages. The good one, which is compiles fast the bad one which gives the exception, and then the page which, which has some problems in compilation which loads in 10 seconds, so it's not so great experience for the first user which access it. So we don't want to use lazy mode for this application because the first user will get quite long loading time. So we can try the other two modes. We have the during application startup mode, which compiles the pages during the startup before the application will handle any requests. So you can see that it takes quite some time to start up. But now even the ugly page should load instantly. This feature is useful if you are using, for example, the slot swapping on Azure because the slot will get swept after the compilation is done, so after the application starts responding to those requests. 
unfortunately this way the development would not be so fun because after every build you will get the long wait times. To combat this you can use the after application startup option. This way you will start the same way as in the lazy layering mode and the pages will get compiled after the initial startup. So we can access the pages just normally, but the ugly long loading page will should uh, will get loaded fast because the startup should be already done. The compilation has some other options too. We can choose whether we want this delay after application start to be zero or if we want to wait some additional time. Yeah, it's done by the background compilation delay property and we can set any time span to wait after, before the compilation is started. The other option is compile in parallel mode. We can choose whether we want the view compilation to be done in parallel. This is useful when we don't want the compilation to take all our resources. Okay. The next feature of I want to show you is the compilation status page. In the VM, unfortunately, you don't get the errors from the views when your application is built. So it can be quite tricky to find all the typos and changes in the view model when you don't see immediately all the errors. To combat this, we created the .vvm compression status page. This isn't new for the .vvm 2.5, it's already present in the previous versions, but it's distributed as a separate NuGet package. You can get it by, by searching for .vvm status page. It can be also downloaded or accessed at GitHub as part of the .vvm contrib. The status page needs to be set up in the .vm startup. So first you need to download the appropriate NuGet package, in this case the .vvm diagnostic status page, and then you can register it by add status page option. When you're done do this, you should get the new route, which is available at slash diagnostics slash status. This page shows you the compilation status of all your pages, controls and master pages. You can visually see which page is, is fine or whether some page has the compilation error. In this case, the bad page is missing the, some control. The compilation status page cannot show you the status of the pages which does not use the .vvm presenter. As you can see here, the .vvm status page API is using some different presenter, so the status is unknown. Unfortunately, this compilation status page cannot be checked automatically or cannot be checked easily automatically. So for this case, we have also created the status page API. To add the page API, you just need to do the options dot add status page API. Okay. Now, when we add slash API, we should get the response from the compilation. If the application loads correctly. And now we see that we have some compilation error in the bad dbat.html. It can be quite dangerous to provide this functionality to the outside world. So we can set up the authorization for the status page, which is defaultly off on production environments and for status page API. This is done by using the version with options and by setting the authorize method. 
Using this method, we can set, set whether the users are allowed to access the page or not. In addition to the, the deciding if the user is authorized or not, the Epic can also, uh, you can also set what will happen if non-authorized user will try to access the API. There are three modes for this. We have deny, which will return 401 for any non-authorized user. We have basic response, which will return 200 if compilation is okay, or 500 if anything breaks. And then we had the response we have seen before, which is the detailed response. In order to prevent the anonymous users to spam the compilation API and to do some DDoS attack, because the compilation is quite quite expensive task to do, then the compilation is done only once. Any subsequent request will only return all the status of the first compilation. Okay, the main reason why you may be interested in the compression API is to integrate it with your CI CD pipeline. If you want to automatically check whether your newly deployed application is okay, you can do it via this API. If you are using the Azure uh, release pipelines, it's as easy as to add new tasks which, which will do the ping to your page at the diagnostic slash status slash API. Okay, this is all from me. Thank you guys for attending the meetup. Does anybody have some question? Uh, I have a, one thing I want to add to the pipeline. I saw that you are doing this after release. So you basically release the app and then make sure that this API works. So it should work for the, for example, some dev environment or something like that. It yeah. shouldn't be a production. But yeah. also, I think that uh, it could be useful if you do this in the build pipeline, uh, because you can run .NET Restore and uh, .NET Build, and then you should be able to call .NET Run and check this, uh, check this even before you try to deploy the thing. Uh, there can be a lot of problems maybe with connecting to the database, so that's what we should figure out. But yeah. I think that for the next version, we should uh, think about uh, being able to do this, um, do this uh, maybe in the in the build phase. So right now this is not supported, but uh, we maybe we should look for a solution for that. Yeah, I think that one of the colleagues is already working on the VM compiler, which should solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The main reason I have this in the release environment is because on uh, my production products we have the desk environment and the release environment and during the you no know, or before the release to the production we are checking if the dev is okay so this way we are we are able to check if the version is okay before the release and before the break to the production okay anybody else with some question Okay, all right. Thank you, Michael, for the session and the demo. It was fun. We need to learn more about the dot area. And uh, if anyone wants to ask any question, now is the time. And also, if anyone wants to present, now is the time. Basically, you can present on anything for a few minutes. Uh, I didn't get any requests from anyone so far for the presentation. Okay. And I have and maybe I have maybe one thing to share. Uh, sure. So uh, we have created uh, a new uh, group on meetup.com slash dot vvm. Uh, so you can you can join us there, and we will also publish all the all the events, all the meetups. Uh, on this page, so uh, that and uh, it sends uh, email notifications. So if you want to uh, stay connected, uh, you can you can uh, register to our new community here on uh, Meetup.com because you will get notifications about other events that we will be doing. 
And the next event we plan to do is uh, .vvmlabs.netconf because uh, on uh, November 10th to 12th, there is the Microsoft Online Conference .netconf. They will be sharing a lot of things about .NET 5 and new, uh, new announcements in the .NET world. And uh, after that, on uh, Monday, November 16th, we will have uh, our own meetup where uh, we will be showing also some things, uh, things uh, uh, related to the to some announcements of .NET Conf. So I think that a lot of things uh, you we will be presenting there. You have already seen here on this meetup. But uh, if you if you subscribe to this community, you will get notifications for all other events that we will be doing. So if you if you want, uh, just subscribe. Uh, on uh, meetup.com slash .vvm. And of course, uh, I recommend to watch uh, .NET Conf. Uh, it's uh, .NET Conf because they will have a lot of uh, sessions in um, about uh, about .NET 5. So it's it's a great conference. So I definitely recommend it to everyone. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for introducing meetup.com. Uh, I will share the link on the WhatsApp group. So if anyone wants, if anyone wants, like if they have their own questions, they can reach out to me or Thomas or anyone can reach out. And if anyone have any presentation, please come forward. Now is the time. Otherwise, uh, we, we can end the meetup. Going home, going twice, going twice. Okay, thank you so much for attending the meetup. And it was really great to have Thomas and Michael. We hope to see you again in the next meetup. And if anyone has any questions related to Dot Vision, they can get in touch with me via email or Thank you. Have a great night. Yeah, goodbye. Then stay 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 safe, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye everyone. Stay